Good evening, my friends. This is Apostle Bio with the Watchman Seas. I have a tremendous word for you this night. I believe that God has got something in store for you. We are in certainly in trouble, some and very trying times these days. And as far as I can see from Scripture, things are going to get worse before they get better. But how do we endure this time? How do we endure the time of all these problems that come up? I'm looking at Scripture. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And it starts off with verse number 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. It goes on to say that we are perplexed, but not in despair persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. You know, it sounds like the enemy is saying is that what the Bible is telling us, that there are times when pressure is going to come from all different directions. And certainly with world affairs the way they are, we can certainly see that there are problems that are on the horizon that many of us are not even prepared for. And in this time, this session, not only am I going to talk to you about that which has now is being evolved in the church, in the country, in our families, and in the world today, but I'm also going to give you the formula that you need to use and can use in order to be victorious, to ward off all of these and to deal with all of these challenges. The Bible says that the, we recognize that in the last days that God is going to pour his wrath out on humanity that has rejected Christ. And it's interesting because the fact is, why would we want to reject the one that says, I give you life, life more abundantly? In looking at scripture, we also see that trouble sometimes. Jesus said in Matthew 24, he says, there are things that are going to happen. There's wars Rumors of wars, pestilence, famine, earthquake. You would think that we were reading today's newspaper. But I want you to get this into your spirit. Even though there's all of these things, and Paul says it here, even though we're perplexed, we don't understand what's going on, even though we really feel that we're hard-pressed, that the pressures are coming from all sides, let's not deal with symptoms, but let's recognize the cause. And once again, I don't look at political figures. I am looking at the fact that there's a dimension that we have to understand that affects all of our lives. There's the good things and the bad things, and we know that. The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. But I'm going to say this. I want to encourage you because God has given you the answer to all of these challenges. In doing the study on Bible prophecy, I began to see that as God is pouring out his wrath on mankind, as I said, who has rejected Christ, the enemy, Satan, Lucifer, would have over the devil, however you want to term the terminology, is fine. Because it's still the same thing. It's somebody that's come to steal, kill, and destroy. But the Bible says that Christ has come to give you and I life, and life more abundantly. When we examine what has happened is, we see that there are various plagues that God is releasing on the earth. But we also see that Satan has four horsemen of the apocalypse that he's now released. And I'm going to cover them. And let's see if you do agree with these because they affect every single one of us. In doing a study, I began to find that the problem with the world today is that we're suffering with what four elements that I'm going to cover today. Going from the lowest to the highest of controlling elements that the enemy uses, you're going to see where God is now working on your behalf. The first thing that Satan has released on our families, on us, on our government, our nation, the world, is a spirit of fear. And I want to address this for a moment. The Bible says that perfect love casts out all fear. For you and I have not been given the spirit of fear, but of love and a power and of a sound mind. I like the Amplified Bible, for it says this. For you have not been given a spirit of cowardice, of fear, but of love, power, and a self-disciplined, well-balanced mind. You see, the thing is this, most of the fear that we experience is an attack against our mind. 
If I take the word of God and I stand on the word of God, you begin to see that God is saying is, I'm giving you those tools that you will need to overcome these challenges. So fear has been released. And I said, Lord, I don't understand this. When did this go to a point that is beyond control? And he said it happened on 9-11, if you remember. That is the day that the Twin Towers was attacked by the enemy of this country. They came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But the thing that bothered me at the time, and still does, is that out of our leaders in this country, many of them kept on saying is, we have to be careful on how we respond because we don't want to get the enemy angry that they will attack us again. My friends, that is fear in its purest sense. That is fear on uh, fear on steroids. I want you to understand something. The, the fact is that uh, I believe it was Franklin Delano Roosevelt that says, the thing that we have to fear is fear itself. Why? Because fear is a paralytic. Fear will just paralyze you so that you don't stay, go out, you don't stay in. As a matter of fact, now with the pandemic, this coronavirus, it has now happened that there's another fear that has come in. It just seems like this one thing goes away, another one takes its place, and it gets worse and worse and worse. My brothers and sisters, the Bible encourages us that we've not been given that spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. With all that has been taking place, with all of the circumstances in the United States and in our families, with this pandemic, it has paralyzed families. Their families are not getting together. We're not celebrating time together. It just seems one thing after another. My brothers and sisters, where we're going with this is the fact is this fear has paralyzed the nation. It has paralyzed the world. It has paralyzed every one of those situations where people are afraid to go out. They're afraid to talk to each other. They're afraid to interact. And the fact is that this paralytic, is a, this cancer, I'm calling it, is because it's become deadly. We see so many reports of how many people died. But you know, the thing is this, what about how many people have been healed by the power of God? We need to stand on the authority of God's word. That we're not going to listen to a negative report. And so what we have seen now is we're beginning to see that God is opening up the eyes of his people and saying, now is the time for us to stand. So I said to the Lord, I said, I understand this a pandemic, if you will. But what about, what about the second step? And the Lord began to show me that there's a spirit that is prevalent across this country and it's hatred and racism. Hatred and racism. I'm seeing people are hating each other that years ago they would never have thought about it because what they would do is they would interact with each other. They would help each other. But yet now we're being told that we're enemies of each other. And it seems like the system is now dictating to us the way that we have been raised up is wrong. And now we're in a situation that we have to be afraid of everything that we say because it's going to offend. Well, I got news for you, brothers and sisters. The Word of God is an offense from Genesis to Revelation. What it does is confronts you with the sin issue. I want you to understand that this whole area of hatred and racism is totally ungodly. First of all, God is colorblind. He created all mankind to be in his own image. And my brothers and sisters, we have to understand that God died for not because of what we look like, but he died because of our sins. Jesus came to set us free. It's imperative for us to begin to understand where we're going with this because the world is paralyzing not only is this a spirit of fear now it's hatred and racism and my word it, it, it's coming to a point where people are not even going to go out it seems that the world is run amok so I said you Lord I understand all of this and the Lord began to show me that there was something another step that was even more dastardly than that and I said Lord what is that and he said it is what I call the python spirit what is the Python spirit? 
The python spirit is actually like a boa constrictor. It wraps itself around you. It begins to apply pressure. I'm hearing people that see, say to me, you know, Apostle, I'm having such a difficult time. I feel pressure here. I feel pressure there. My kids are pulling from there. People are pulling from here. Bill collectors there. I, 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 I've got It's all coming and it's hitting at all, all times. I just feel I can't even breathe anymore. That is how the python spirit works works. It will literally suffocate you so that you no longer can even control yourself and the enemy will do this to such a degree that literally it will snuff the light out of you, the life out of you. Folks, suicides today are an epidemic proportion. Why? Because the python spirit is just stuffing, snuffing the light out of individuals. That's right, my brothers and sisters. But there's a hope. I'll get to that shortly. So I said, now, Lord, I said, I understand this. We have already covered three. And he said, yeah, but there's a fourth one, which is even worse. And all of them put together, because out of it, what it does, it literally is the power and it's the source that feeds all of the others. And I said, okay, I don't know which one it is. And he said, to me, it's what they call the Jezebel spirit. Now, I, I, I want you, don't turn off now. Don't turn me off. I'm not talking about a female. I'm not talking about a male because it's a spirit. It's gender neuter. I want you to understand it's neither male nor female. Even though the scripture identifies a woman by the name of Jezebel, but it's a characteristic and it's a spirit behind her that we have to understand where we truly are today. The Jezebel spirit comes to manipulate, to dominate, and to control. Understand this, what is manipulation? Manipulation is getting you to do something you normally would not do. We're now approaching that time of the year, which is Christmas, and we see that children, they love to watch everything on TV. There's this toy, that toy, this toy, that toy, and it just seems that every time they see it, they're going, well, I want that, daddy, I want that, mommy, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want that. And there's, it's the gimme-itis, if you will. But we need to look at that. The fact is that the children will then, when they go to the supermarket, to go to the store, the, the department store, uh, all of a sudden they start saying, Mom, I want this, Mom, I want this, Mom, I want this. And they literally would drive, excuse the vernacular, they'll drive the mother or father crazy. Why? Because they're determined that they want to get what they want. Okay? And they ultimately will do it to a point where it will literally cause the parents to say, okay, enough is enough is enough. I give up. I'll get you what you want. I'm reminded of a story that a preacher one time said. He said there was a woman that had a, a five-year-old child and would take this child to the market with her whenever she had to do shopping. And it seemed that every time she would go into the store, this child would have a temper tantrum. The child would want buy this toy, buy that candy, buy those cookies, buy that ice cream. And his child would literally have temper tantrums right there in the store. One day this child started because saw that things really weren't working out to his or her expectation. Well, what ends up happening is the child turns to the mother and says, If you don't get me the toy that I want, I'm going to take all my clothes off and I'm going to be stark naked here in the store. That mother was that mother was totally mortified. And she said, no, you are. And all of a sudden, the child begins to remove their, their clothes. And all of a sudden, the mother stops and buys the child what it needed. Well, about a week or two later, that same situation happened. A week or two later, it happened again. And she kept on giving in, redefining those lines. Well, what happened is she said so the time came that the child needed to go to the pediatrician, which was an old country doctor. And what happened is she said to the doctor, doctor, I'm besides myself. I don't know what to do with my son. He said, well, what's the matter? Every time I go to the market, the child, at one time, they you were pressing me and everything like that until I finally gave in. And then all of a sudden, the child came to a point and says, mama, if you don't buy me that toy, I'm going to take my clothes off. You see, now this is... The manipulation with intimidation. In other words, it's getting you to do something that you normally wouldn't do. And if you don't give in, then there's a threat that there's going to be something else far worse will take place. 
I know that there are those of you that can relate to what I'm talking about. Tell your children you can't have the car, you can't have the keys to the car. Well, all of a sudden, they, all of a sudden, the threats start coming out. Why? Because we have redefined the lines. Mm. Understand this. So what happens is the pediatrician says to the woman, bring the son into here. And he says, I'm going to give him an examination. And while well, the child is in there, the doctor checks his ears and checks his heart. And they're all, all the things that the doctor normally would do. Keeping in mind what mother had said. He said, son, he says, I hear you're having some problems with mom whenever you go to the market. And the boy started laughing. Immediately, the doctor knew that this was all an act in order to get what he wanted. So this old country doctor looked at the boy and he said, Okay, son, he says, I'm through at your examination. He says, but leave your clothes here. The little boy looked at the doctor like it was, you know, the doctor had to be crazy. What are you talking about? My exam is over with. I need to go, but mama, I got to put my clothes on. The doctor says, no, your clothes stay here. He says, but I got to put my clothes on to go out there. He said, no, your clothes belong to me. He says, you're not going to pull on me the same thing that you pull on your mother. And this child began to cry and all of a sudden the, uh, the crocodile tears, you know what I'm talking about. The child is crying, oh, crying for mama and everything like that. Mama comes running in thinks, thinking the doctor had done something to hurt the child. And there she comes in and lo and behold, there's the son stark naked. And the doctor looks at her and he says, ma'am, you can take your son home now. She says, but it's close. She says, he says, no, the clothes belong to me. Take your son home. Takes the son home. About a month later, the doctor, she comes back to the doctor. Doctor says, how are things going? She says, doctor, she says, I don't know what happened. She says, what do you mean? He, she said, well, she says, after I left here and I got home, I gave him some clothes and we went shopping and he didn't have any temper tantrums. And he says, well, what are you talking about? He, she said, he just didn't have any temper tantrums. She said, because I told him the answer was no and that was final. See, what happened is the child was going to test mother to see how far he can get along. That is manipulation. The threats were, I'm going to take my clothes off. And that's exactly, brothers and sisters, I want you to understand something, that the Jezebel spirit is manipulating us. How do I see that? Well, churches can't have church because of the coronavirus. You need to put on the mask every place you go. Please, I'm not saying that we need to be insensitive or calloused, that we don't take proper precautions. What I am saying is that the system is now putting people in bondage. And if remember that these three, three ste steps before the Jezebel spirit, we talked about fear. We talked about hatred and racism. And matter of fact, I've even seen cases where people would go into a store and if they didn't have their mask on because they already had their shots, I saw people get very ugly with them. You need to put your mask on. But I got my shot. I don't want to care. That. I don't want to know that. See what I'm saying? All of a sudden, the hatred, the visceral is now escalated in an ever-increasing proportion. The Jezebel spirit comes to steal, to kill and destroy, to manipulate, to dominate, basically to total control. And we're seeing that. We see that in our government. We see it in our homes. We see it in our churches in many instances where there are people that they literally, they rely on being able to control other people. So where do we go from here? You can turn around and simply say, I toss, throw in the towel. Everything is over with me. God says, no, 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 no. He says, I have given you weapons. Understand this. And one day I, I was getting ready to, I was pastoring a church in Pennsylvania. And I said, Lord, what kind of message do you want me to preach on Sunday? And he says, well, I want you to talk about the story of David and Goliath. I said, oh, come on, Lord. I mean, I can't go down that road because David and Goliath, as far as I'm concerned, I've preached that message so many times. He says, but I'm going to give you a revelation into that that you've never seen before. I said, I don't understand that. He says, you will. 
So I began to read the passage and it says that David was anointed with oil by Samuel and the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came upon him from that day forward and David goes out into the pasture and he now begins to take care of his father's sheep. He had before, but even though he's now anointed to become king, and I'm going to say this to you, even though God has an anointing and a appointing for you, understand this, don't try to run ahead of God. David had to go back to the pasture and we're going to see the reason why he did that. Because as David was there and he began to take care of the sheep, lo and behold, the one day there was a lion that came and wanted to eat one of his uh, the father's sheep. And David, seeing this, raises, rises up in righteous indignation, goes after the lion and grabs it by the jaw and literally it breaks, tore, tore the jaw apart and kills the lion. Also during that same time, a little time went by, a bear comes and wants to do the same thing and he kills the bear. You see, but during this time that David is taking care of the sheep, something interesting was happening to David. And I'm going to say this to you that are feeling pressed on all sides. I'm just speaking to you that are going through this time, the hatred and racism, on the boa constrictor, the Jezebel conspiracy. I want you to get this into your spirit because what David learned in taking care of his father's sheep he perfected his praise. You say, Apostle, what do you mean by that? He began to praise God. He began to say things like, uh, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. He said, Bless his holy name. Forget none of his benefits. I will look up into the hills from whence cometh my help. He says, Even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for I know that you're there. You comfort me. Your rod and your staff are there for me. David began to perfect his praise and it carried him through the time of killing the lion and the bear. Well, let's move the clock forward. Time comes that David's father gets a hold of him and says, David, he says, your brothers are at war and I need for you to take uh, some food to them. Because you see, at that time, it was a volunteer army. And so David gets his baskets of food and everything like that. He had several brothers that were on the front lines fighting against the Philistines. David gets on the scene and he hears this thunderous voice. And it's a challenge from one of the uh, Philistines who happened to be a, a giant by the name of Goliath. And he's challenging the children of Israel. He's challenging King Saul. He's challenging the champion of the Israelites. And nobody is responding to go against Goliath. And by the way, I'm going to say this from the natural side. You need to understand that Goliath had an armor bearer that was carrying a shield and was also carrying uh, Goliath's sword, uh, spear rather. Goliath's armor weighed over 380 pounds. This guy was gargantuan. He was nine feet tall. He weighed over 300 pounds. This guy was a mean machine, fighting machine. And he intimidated. Understand, that's that spirit of Jezebel again. He was manipulating and intimidating to dominate the children of Israel. So much so that there was no one that had any courage to go against him. David comes in on the scene and all of a sudden he's hearing, he's hearing this voice and he says, Wait a minute, where are the champions of the children of Israel? Why is not someone going out to challenge him? His brothers are telling him, David, shut your mouth. He says, you're a young upstart. Stay, keep your mouth shut. Go back to taking care of your father's sheep. David said, if nobody's got the courage to deal with that giant, I'll do it. Now, either David was a young upstart runt who didn't know and he was arrogant and broke, uh, you know, uh, uh, brought, uh, bragging and everything like that. Or he knew something that the warriors on the front line were not aware of. It's interesting because the book of Revelation gives us some insight into that. It says because the Bible says that they overcame the enemy. That's Satan. But in this case, it was Goliath. They overcame him by the word of their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. Now, you got to understand something. What David was doing, he was when he confronted Goliath, he said to him, he says, you come to me 
with the sword and the shield. But I come to you in the name of Lord God Almighty, whose armies you have defied this day, and I will chop your head off. David was not being intimidated because he perfected his praise that carried him through the lion and the bear experience. And when he saw Goliath, he saw the same situation. You're nothing more than the same thing as a lion and a bear. And if God gave me the ability to slay them, God's going to give me the power to cut your head off. I happen to be Italian, and I read the account in the Italian Bible, and I like it. It's a little bit more emphatic, because it says, it's David says to Goliath, in the Italian language, it says this, to speak with a la testa. In other words, I'm going to cut your, chop your head off with your orange sword. Think about that. Either David was, uh, uh, you know, either he didn't know what he was talking about, or he knew something that they all didn't. David, the Bible says that when Goliath heard that, he ran towards David. But before this, David picked up five stones from a brook. Now, I want to stop there because I'm going to get back to Goliath and David in a moment. The thing that we have to understand is, is, is God all-knowing? Well, absolutely he is. The Bible says that he knows the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end. God knows everything. He knows everything about you and I. And you see, what we do is when we're trying to understand God in the natural sense, we limit him. But I want to give you another insight in who God is. The Bible says that in the beginning was the word and God created, uh, Jesus created all things. And it says that God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1, 25 to 28. And it says, let us create man in our own image. That means let us create mankind in our own image. And he created he them. The fact is that he created us not body, soul, and spirit. He created us spirit, soul, and body. Why? We were created first. On the first day, we were created in the spirit form, but on the sixth day, we were created out of the dust of the earth, and our spirit and our soul got deposited into what I call the earth suit. Yes, that's right. Now, so the fact is that we have to understand that in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he already knew your name, he already knew your destiny, he already knew your purpose, and he looked, God looked through the corridor of time, and when he said, earth be, God created the earth knowing that a guy by the name of David was going to have an encounter with Goliath, because God is all-knowing. And knowing that David was going to have a date with history, God said David is going to need some assistance. So what did he do? He turned around when he created earth. He created five stones at that brook where David was going to come by, knowing that David was going to pick up those stones. And he picked up each one of them and put five stones in his pouch. Now, a lot of people say, well, where was David's faith? If he's a man of faith, then why did he pick up five stones when there was one giant? Well, if you read that account in in Kings and in Chronicles, you'll find out something interesting. You find out that David recognized that the enemy, Goliath, had four other brothers that were meaner and uglier than he was. David wasn't picking up uh, five stones for one giant. David was picking up five stones for five giants. Basically, he was saying is, I'm going to deal with you, and then I'll deal with them if they dare to rise up against me. See, I want you to keep this in mind, believers, my friends. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. If God is for us, then who can stand against us? Stop operating as a wimp and start working as a warrior. David picked up those five stones and God said to me this. He said, understand something. I never do anything without a purpose. In creation, I created all spirits of everything that would ever be existent on the planet. And he says, and I gave them a destiny. I knew that David was going to have a date with destiny at that brook. So when I said earth be, I created those stones because I knew that David would have need. Now keep this in mind. This is important. Because David would never have been able to fulfill his destiny unless God put those stones there. 
And those stones would never have been able to fulfill their destiny unless the man of God showed up. That's right. You are a man or a woman of destiny. God has got a purpose for you in your life. God is saying is, be not afraid for I, the Lord, your God, go before you. I prepare the way and I will make a provision where there is no provision. So I said, you Lord, Lord, I said, that's all cool. I understand. I see where you're coming. I said, but what about the significance of the stones? And he says, I'm going to give you the name a name for each one of those stones. Now, you're not going to find it in Scripture, so don't get religious and say, I'm a heretic, because that's not the case. But you're going to see what those stones all represent. He picked up the first stone, and the Lord said that the first stone's name happens to be praise. Praise precedes warfare. How do we know that? Well, because the fact is that we recognize that Jehoshaphat, when he went against the, the Amorites, and the, the enemy, what happened is God told him, he says, Je uh, Jehoshaphat, don't send out the warriors first. He says, I want you to send out the praisers. Excuse me, God, that don't make no sense. What kind of a military mastermind are you? He says, but he obeyed God. And he sent out the musicians first and the praisers. And they began to praise God as they went forth. And the Bible says that as they praised, that God released his warring angels to do battle against the enemy. And the enemy thought that it was a great army that was coming against them. And the enemy began to kill each other. And when Joshua, uh, Jehoshaphat, and his soldiers got there, guess what? All of the enemy was dead. I understand this. God is saying is, the battle is mine, saith the Lord. He says, but he wants you and I to show up so we can pick up the spoils of war. Think about that. God said, let me fight your battle. You know, sometimes when we're going through challenges, we cry out to God. God is simply saying this, I want to work on your behalf, but do me a favor. Just get out of my way because I got something to do. Sometimes we get in God's way and God simply shakes his head. No, I need for you to step aside so that I can show you my power, my mercy, and my grace. So the first stone is a stone of praise. And here's what I'm saying is, we do not spend enough time in praise. I was sharing with some people this morning that what oftentimes happens is we are like a shadow boxer. We're going into a warfare and all we're doing is we're shadow boxing. We're not hitting anything. Why? Because we haven't gone forth with praise. Praise is what David did and that perfected him to carry him through the lion, the bear, and the Goliath experience. You got those challenges, you got those giants, and every one of us has got gi giants in our lives. Whether it's unsaved uh, loved ones, whether it's a physical need, financial need, material need, it doesn't make any difference. And you could call it whatever you want in the natural, but there's still giants. And God says you could praise your way through it. Now, I I'm saying this. There's a different types of praise, and I hear that there's uh, there's there's gospel rock. I hear this. I, I said, you know, the thing is, is what we need to do is go back to the Psalms. My wife one time was going through a time where she was on the verge of a nervous breakdown, and she says, I don't know what to do. And it was at nighttime, and I said, well, honey, put sound soft worship music in the background and start reading the Book of Psalms. Now, my wife is the type of person, she needs to get her eight hours of sleep. I can get away with less than that, but she needs her eight hours of sleep. And so she began to read the scripture, Psalm 1. Then she went to 2, 3, 4. The biggest one was challenged with Psalm 19, and then she went beyond that to Psalm 150. And it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden, and she realized that she was still having, the problem wasn't quite as acute, but it was still there. So she started all over again. It was probably around 4 o'clock in the morning when she got through and she felt this breakthrough. Why? Because she was reading the word and she had praise music, that worship, that soft worship music. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And words to that effect. And what happened is her spirit got energized. And she was able to see the breakthrough on the other side. And the word was powerful working in her. I'm simply saying, folks, 
I love African American churches because they say our highest worship is hallelujah. Begin to love on him. Begin to worship him in the beauty of holiness. He'll meet you right there. The second one, the second stone that David picked up, God said to me, the name of that stone is called the name of Jesus. The Bible says that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess and declare that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Understand this, when you knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that's the only way this works. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you find yourself in that corner where the enemy is coming in, from all different directions and all you do is cry out Jesus I need your help the moment you declare Jesus name at that moment the Bible says everything in heaven stops and comes to attention and drops to its knees and begins to worship Jesus as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to the glory of God. It said that on earth every knee is ultimately going to bow and worship him. Understand this to all of you that are in that political religious conviction. I want you to understand uh, the Bushes are going to bow the knee. Jimmy Carter is going to bow the knee. Uh, Obama is going to bow the knee. Clinton is going to bow the knee. Trump is going to bow the knee. Biden is going to bow the knee. Every single one of them will bow the knee because Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is not a political statement. I'm simply saying that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. But you see, most of us stop there. God is saying is I got something else that you haven't even tapped into. It says that the earth beneath. What does that mean? It means that every principality and power, the rulers of the darkness, Paul says, that we wrestle not against flesh or blood. But if we wrestle against principalities and powers, get this into your spirit. At the name of Jesus, principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness must bow the knee. Poverty, has to bow the knee to the name of Jesus. Cancer, hear me, dear, somebody out there, you're going through a battle with cancer. Cancer has to bow the knee to the name of Jesus. Coronavirus, you must bow the knee to the name of Jesus. Physical, sexual, emotionally abuse, that has to bow the knee to the name of Jesus. Why? There's power in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to say this. This gets me really excited. Not only principalities and powers, and I already mentioned that, but Satan himself has to bow the knee to the name of Jesus and declare that he's a king of kings. He's a Lord of lords. You see, there's power in the name of Jesus. When's the last time that you've used it as a weapon? The third weapon, the third stone that Jesus, uh, David picked up was also known as the blood. I remember there was a man by the name of Andre Crouch that sang a song that the blood will never leave it lose its power. He reaches to the highest mountain. It goes to the deepest valley. The blood of Jesus has never lost its power. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm going to say this. Satan's greatest defeat and miscalculation was the day that he allowed Jesus to go on the cross and die because there's power in the blood of Jesus. Us. To show you about the blood, when the children of Israel were in Egypt, God said that I'm going to send the angel of death and it's going to go directly to Pharaoh's house because he has rejected everything I've told him. He said, now understand this, the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike and I'm going to send the angel of death. Now, when he comes by your house, make sure you've got the blood on the doorpost. For when he sees the blood, he will pass over you. I'm going to say this, my brothers and sisters. It worked in the day of of when the children of Israel were in Egypt. And it will work in your life, in your house. And I'm going to say this. If you've never anointed your house with oil, I would simply say, get yourself a bottle of anointing oil. Contact this station and come here and get an anointing cloth. Start anointing oil, using it upon your house, on the doorpost. The enemy has no authority to cross it. Not even the angel of death that is an assignment by God has the authority to cross that bloodline. You've got power that you haven't even touched yet. There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. 
The fourth weapon that we have is the Word of God. The Bible says that the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And I'm going to say this. If the only thing you know to use is the Word of God, please use it for all it's worth. It works. The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. How do I know that? Because when Jesus was tempted by Satan, Jesus addressed him by these words. It is written. He was saying is, it's God's word. You have power by exercising the word of God. How do we know that? An example. Father, I thank you that your word says that by Christ's stripes I am healed. David says this, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed ever begging for bread. That takes care of the poverty situation. I want you to understand, so I'm start quoting the scripture at those problems and simply say, thus saith the Lord. When you do that, you walk in victory. The Lord will give you the breakthrough. The fifth stone is what I call prayer. There's various types of prayer. And I want you to get this into your spirit. Prayer comes this way here. First of all, we start off, the Bible says, it says, make your petitions or your prayers known unto God. God wants to hear from your heart. Doesn't mean that he doesn't know what's going on because the Bible says that before you even pray or before you even speak, he's already answered. Could you imagine that? God already knows your problems. Already, He's already sent the solution. Problem is we're not tapping in to the solution that God has sent us. I was sharing with some people, how do I pray for my children? You know, they're all grown and they're all gone their own way. How do I pray for them if they're away from us? And I, you know, you, we as parents, we want to not necessarily control, but we want our best interest for our children. So one day I was thinking and the Holy Spirit said, well, how you pray? Uh, and there's a there's a, a denomination called the Church of God, and the fact is that they have a phrase that I just dearly love. And the phrase is this: If you were to ask any aged saint in those churches, what is your testimony? And they would say this: I want to thank God that I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and on my way to heaven. Hmm. Think about that. So understand this. So when you're talking about and thinking about your children that may not be serving God. We said use the word. What is the word? Father, your word says that me and my household are saved. That's not a promise, my brothers and sisters. That is a declaration that God has made it. And when God makes a declaration, you can bank on it regardless of what the circumstances are, regardless of what the situation of say is going on. It doesn't change God's word. God's word is an absolute. It says what it means, and it means what it says. And I'm saying this to you, if you use that, God is going to operate and work on your behalf. As a matter of fact, David became so engrossed in God's ways and his word. He said, your word not only revives me and gives me life, he says, but my family is saved to the thousandth generation. Could you imagine what that means? It actually means that if a, thousand, if a generation is 40 years, that means that for the next 40,000 years, my family is guaranteed that God is going to bring salvation to my house. You see, the problem is if we're looking at circumstances, we're limiting, limiting, limiting God. But if I look at God's word, there's no limit to what God wants to do. So how do we pray? Father, I thank you that my son or my daughter, I thank you that according to your word, that they're saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. On their way to heaven and fulfilling the destiny that you already established in eternity past. For your word will not return unto you void. I thank you for your word. Then you see, once you pray that, that's called the prayer of petition. What I recommend to you is that you get another prayer partner. 
It could be a spouse, it could be a brother, it could be a sibling, it could be a parent, someone that will not gossip, but someone that will come into agreement with you. The Bible says this, it says, if any two shall agree on earth as touching the same thing, asking God the Father, it's already done. You see, that's the prayer of agreement, is the place of power. So not only do I pray for my son and my daughter, and I pray the prayer of petition, then I hook up with my wife, and now the Bible says one chases a thousand, two set 10,000 to flight, but now this is also the place of agreement, which is the place of power, and now one chases a thousand, as I said, and two thousand to God, ten thousand to God to flee. Understand this. That's not where you stop. Because I see too many people, they keep on coming back, keep on coming back. Lord, you see my son, you see my daughter. See, now what we need to do is go to phase three. What is the phase three? We need to start thanking him that it's already done. Years ago in Sunday school, we used to sing a song. Uh, and, and it's in regards that God's promise. Every promise in the book is mine. Every pro chapter, every verse, every line. So we used to sing that. But God began to show me that who he is. He, I know he does make certain promises. But when God makes a statement... It's a declaration. You could bank on it. We said earlier, by his stripes. This is God's word. If God said it, I believe it, it settles it. God said, I'm going to supply all of your need according to my riches and glory. I'm going to say this during the coronavirus. I've not been able to go out and minister like I've done in the past. But you know something? God has already met my need and he's already exceeded that one. I can never dare to think or ask. Why? Because he said, I will supply. That's a declaration. I'm not possibly going to. He didn't say, depending upon how your the state of affairs are. He says, I will supply all of your need according According to my riches and glory. Start standing on God's word. Start using the stones that God has given you. Number one, use praise. Father, I praise you. I thank you. I glorify you. I exalt your holy name. Father, I bless you for you've been faithful. You've been faithful. You've been faithful time and time again. Then begin to use the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus. I take authority over that, this, this, and that. And then you go to the story, uh, number three. It's the blood of Jesus. What I used to do with my children in the morning before they even went to uh, to work or school or whatever it was, I would go by their beds and I put my hands on the footbed of the bed and I would say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you right now to cover them by the blood of Jesus, overshadow them. Father, I declare, decree, and proclaim the blood of Jesus over, around, in, and through. Folks, this is powerful right now. It's powerful. And you can be more than a conqueror through Christ by exercising and using the stone that God has given you these weapons of warfare. The sword of the spirit. The fact is that God has not called you to be a wimp. He's called you to be a warrior. And a warrior certainly has a sword. And understand this. When most and ever I talk to people about spiritual warfare, they want to go to the book of Ephesians, which is okay. And that talks about putting on the whole armor of God. But you understand this. Of all of the pieces of the armor, put on the uh, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. We understand that every one of them are all defensive with the exception of one weapon. And that's the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit is both offensive and defensive. It's used to go in and to take back what the enemy has stolen from you. He's stolen your houses. He's stolen your car. He's stolen your health. He's stolen your children. Now is the time that you start standing on the authority of God's word and begin to exercise that in the name of Jesus. Because the, the Bible says that the word of God will not return void unto him. In other words, it will not come back without producing that which God has sent it out to produce. So we have the prayer of petition. We have the prayer of agreement. And then my brothers and sisters, there's the prayer of thanksgiving. I may have more bills to the gills, but I could turn around and say this, Father, I thank you that you've already met my need. I don't know how he's going to do it, but nevertheless, 
when the pandemic, the coronavirus exploded, and then all of a sudden, all of ministry for us was over with, my confidence was not in the ability of getting bookings for speaking engagements. My reliance was on God. He said, I'll supply all of your need, which is not a promise. It is a declaration of fact. Stand on the authority of God's word. I, I'm sensing something right now. There's too many times when we're reading scripture and we're rationalizing it. And it's called the earth suit mentality. It's what I think, feel, want, and see. That's in the sense realm. When you are operating in the sense realm, you're partaking of the tree of good and evil or the tree of knowledge with where the sin nature came from. We have to reverse it. And that's the reason why we partake of the tree of life, which is in Jesus Christ. Understand this. I prefer life over death. Amen. Come on. I'm praying this prayer. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you remove the scales over every eye of those that are viewing this broadcast. That, Father, you're going to transform them, that they're going to begin to see the Scripture and begin to see Scripture and interpret it as you have said it. For, Father, in that there is life and life more abundantly. I'm going to say this in closing. The final weapon is not really a weapon as much as it's the sling that David took. Remember, it says that he took the five stones and put it in his pouch. I want you to get this into your spirit. Because what he did was he took the stone and he put it into the sling. The Lord showed me that the sling was the power. Better yet, it was the Holy Spirit was that element. Understand, how many times have you seen these war pictures and everything like that about Iraq? And we see the smart bombs that, you know, a, a, hel a plane or a helicopter may be 20, 30, 40 miles away. And all of a sudden it launches the, that missile. And they say that it's a smart bomb. It will go directly to the target and it will not miss. Hmm. You know something? That's nothing new. Because I am convinced that David is the first one that had a smart bomb. That's right. That's right. I'm convinced that as David saw Goliath and he put that stone in that sling, remember, that stone had a destiny. Remember I said that a while back. That stone had a destiny. And the destiny of that stone was to kill Goliath. I am convinced that if David were to have turned around and walked away from Goliath, but still have that stone in that sling, and if he would have wound up and released that stone going in the opposite direction, I am convinced that that stone had no other choice but to boomerang, come back, and hit Goliath right in the vulnerable part. Why? Because that stone had a destiny that was not of its own but it was a destiny that God had put in and that assignment was the destruction of the enemy. Believers, I'm letting you know that every one of these stones has a destiny and God has given you the weapons of warfare to do battle against the enemy so you can deal with the element of fear that we talked about that the enemy is a launch against racial racism and hatred against the Python spirit against the Jezebel spirit. My brothers and sisters, these weapons are the tools that God has given you to overcome all of the tactics of the enemy. But it's important. Daniel, the book of Daniel says this, they who know their God will do great exploits or great feats of heroism. I want you to get this now into your spirit. I don't like to read things at face value. But what I do is I look at it, how God said it. And I went back to the original language. And this is how that verse in Daniel actually reads into the original language. It says this, for those, for the people of God that intimately, personally, lovingly know their God are the ones who will do the exploits. For this is the inheritance of the saints. Now, I want you to hear me now. There's a lot of people in this world that know about God 
and they know about Jesus. And continuously throughout the whole day, many of them curse both their names. They'll damn God. They'll curse Jesus. They'll do all of that. The problem is, all they do is they have a knowledge of God and they have a knowledge of Jesus. There's a difference of having a knowledge of and then having a knowledge of knowing the person. See, they know about God. They know about Jesus. But when you know that you know that you know who God is, when you know you know that you know who Jesus is, you have life and life abundantly. I'm going to challenge with you out there. I believe that there's someone that is at the end of the rope that is a, has been contemplating committing suicide. I'm convinced that there's someone out there that is going through a very, very difficult, abusive situation. I'm going to say to you, if you stand on the authority of your word, if you've never accepted or asked Jesus to come into your life, to become the Lord of your life, I would like for you to repeat after me. Nobody has to be with you, but just repeat after me, dear Jesus. I made a mess of my life. I have all of these challenges that I'm being faced with and I can't handle them. Apostle Bio said that you are the source of my strength. I ask you to come into my heart. Cleanse me of all my sins. Wash me and make me new again. Father, I thank you that you've sent Jesus who died on the cross for my sins. I confess that Jesus is the Christ, that he's your son, and that he's coming back for a church without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. Father, I receive Jesus. Help me now as I go to the next step to start serving you in spirit and in truth. I thank you for salvation. I thank you that you've cleansed me. Satan, I am set free. I am no longer under the bondage that you would try to keep me under, trying to keep me as an inferior individual. I am now a new creation in Jesus Christ. You have no authority against me. I am covered by the blood of Jesus. I've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. I am now a new creation. I am now not under your control. I now have citizenship in heaven. And Father, I thank you that it's already done. For it's not by might nor by power, but by your Spirit. Now, my friend, if you've prayed that prayer and never prayed it before, I want you to call up this station, iGospel Network Television. If you call the station, they will put information into your hands. They will bless you and bless you indeed. For those of you that are born again believers and have been in, in, interested in this booklet that I wrote, it is called, You Can Be a Giant Killer Too. I have a website that is called bioministries at gmail.com or bioministries.org. And if you go there, you'll find a whole group of books that I've written, not only myself, but several other people. I know that this will be blessed. And if you send it, it, you can also pay for it by PayPal or Square. And I know that you will richly be blessed. I know that God has got this in your hands. We'll have it in your hands for a purpose so that you can use this as a manual to help you, to guide you through your challenges. I thank the Lord for this. The Lord bless you. We will meet again. My next broadcast is going to be the status of the church and where do we go from here. The Lord bless you till we meet again. This is Apostle Bio, the watchman sees. The Lord bless you. Love, peace, and increase to you and your families. Amen. Greetings, my dear brothers and sisters. The iGospel Broadcasting Network is hosting right now our Telethon Prayer and Praise Hotline. Our goal is to provide no-cost avenues of broadcasting for ministries, churches, and gospel performers to expand the good news of Jesus Christ around the world. By hosting various global outreach events, family recreational activities, providing tools and technology, we will help in the expansion of the kingdom of God. Tune in right now to IGBN.org or call us at 314-499-6200 for prayer, encouragement, 
inspiration, and tell us your praise report. Friends, we humbly ask you to partner with us. Your donation will help this fruitful ministry expand and continue to grow. To God be the glory.